we finished the paper and uh, we thought we had this really quite nice result. And so we uh, submitted it to the journal. I knew that we were going to have this problem because I'd had a similar problem before when I wrote a, a paper which we entitled Cosmic Springs. And the journal we submitted to uh, wrote back saying, this is a very nice piece of work, but the title won't do. And we had to make it a very technical title. So I thought this might happen. And anyway, we submitted it off. But within an hour of submitting it to physical review, uh, the editor who was in charge of it wrote back. It was a, quite a funny re reply where he wrote, as far as I know, the Beatles have made no contribution to the field of cosmology. And uh, basically he was telling, telling us to get rid of all <laughs> references to George, Paul, Ringo and John. Okay, so this is a, a paper that I've uh, recently written with uh, two colleagues here at Nottingham and uh, another colleague in France. And the title of the paper is General Second Order Scalar Tensor Theory, Self-Tuning and the Fab Four. So obviously the curious bit about that is the bit at the end, which is the Fab Four, which does refer to John, Paul, George and Ringo, um, four lads from my hometown that uh, went on to form the Beatles. This is a, is a serious scientific paper. It, uh, it presents a, a solution or a possible solution to one of the most difficult problems in physics, which is the cosmological constant problem. And uh, as I said, we're trying to solve this, this, this very difficult problem. And we started with, with something very, very general. And we managed to really reduce our theory down to four key elements. And so it was, given how difficult it was and how general it was in, in the beginning, the fact that it reduced to four very simple key elements. At one stage, we thought it was seven. So we called them the Magnificent Seven, but then we actually realized that three of those were, were sort of trivial. So we, we, seven became four. Well, I'm, I'm from Liverpool, so uh, I was born in the same hospital as, uh, as John Lennon. Um, so, you know, it's kind of close to my heart. These are our sort of four key elements of the theory, which is this is the sort of really what described the theory. We don't have to worry about, you know, what, what this means. But as you can see, we've named them John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Okay, so, so yeah, so we sent it off to, to, the, uh, to the journal and it immediately came back without having been uh, assessed by, by any, any experts, just saying um, that there's no way we're going to publish uh, a paper with all these references to the Beatles in it uh, in view of the Beatles' limited contribution to cosmology. So what happened next is basically we, we had to change it, we had to cave in really, we, we didn't have much choice in the matter uh, because it's important to get these papers into journals and the scientific content certainly good enough to manage that. Uh, so we just had to call John number one, Paul number two, George number three and Ringo number four, which is a, not quite as colourful. The Fab Four lives on uh, because in, in, in certainly in, in our field of, of research, the way that uh, uh, we submit papers now, it's kind of a dual process. Um, in, in particle theory, you submit your papers, once you've finished them, you submit them to an electronic archive. And uh, that electronic archive every day gets updated with new papers. And um, then you can, you can submit that, the paper you've um, sent to the archive, you can also submit it to a journal for refereeing. So we submitted it to the archive and it's living on the archive and it's downloaded and it's been referenced quite a few times. It's kind of there now, it's done. And actually we're going to write another paper on this subject and uh, we'll certainly be referring to it as the Fab Four. So it's set in stone now, and the, one day the journals are just going to have to accept that. <laughs> George, uh, Ringo, Paul and John don't appear in the one submitted to the journal. But apart from that, they're the same. We've, we, we haven't changed anything else. Academic papers are very serious, important things, and this sounds like some pretty serious, mm. highbrow work. Mm. Why would you put a joke in something funny in it? Why do you do it in the first place? I mean... Because we're a fun group. We enjoy our work. I, if you don't enjoy your work, go and do something else. Earn a lot of money doing something else. We, for us, it's... Um, it, it, you know, the calculations we've done are, are correct, as far as we know. And they're, they're all done very seriously. And we, get, we got together on a regular basis, all of us, to discuss it and check things. And it was towards the end that, that uh, we realised there were these four terms em emerged and we just, when, you, when you're writing your notes, you just rather than calling them A, B, C, D, we thought, well, let's call them, let's give them a name. So we're trying to um, basically attack the cosmological constant problem, which is probably the hardest problem or the most 
embarrassing problem in, in physics today. We, we look out in the, in the universe around us, and imagine you, you took out all the planets and all the stars. The universe would be empty, but it wouldn't mean that it had zero energy. It would have what we call a vacuum energy. Well, we can see the effect of the vacuum energy on, on the expansion of the universe. So one thing that a vacuum energy will do to, to a universe's expansion is it will, it will cause its expansion to accelerate. The space, the space itself, is getting bigger. But gravity is an attractive force. So strictly speaking, an attractive, fo attractive force will slow down an expansion. That's not what's happening. That's not what we're seeing. And one of the explana explanations for that is that it's actually vacuum energy that's causing it to accelerate. So what the, what the vacuum energy does is it turns that deceleration into an acceleration. So, so the big question is, where does vacuum energy come from? Well, well the, the vacuum, the vacuum energy comes from the vacuum. But then you count, you look at particle physics and you say, OK, let's try and count what we think the vacuum energy should be. We can observe what it is, but let's try and work it out from first principles. You look at, say, the electron and you see that the electron contributes some vacuum energy. It has its own vacuum energy, it contributes some energy to the vacuum. All the other particles do the same. And when you add all this up, you realise there's a huge mismatch between what you expect to see and what you actually see. So what people, some people expect is that, for example, that actually the, the vacuum energy is zero, but perhaps quantum corrections give you a very small vacuum energy. This would be the dream. Some symmetry in, of nature takes the vacuum energy to zero and quantum corrections make it sort of slightly, you know, slightly just above zero, for example. But this is very, very hard to do, to find that symmetry that takes you to zero vacuum energy in the first place. That's what we've set out to do. We've set out to try and, try and find that. And uh, our starting point was, was really, we, we started looking at the way gravity behaves. So to try and understand how, how gravity behaves, is you think of it from a particle physicist's point of view. I mean, we, we often talk about gravity as being curvature of space and time. That's like, that's like the relativist's view of gravity. I want to think of this from a particle physicist's point of view. And what gravity is, or what any force is, actually, is the exchange of, of virtual particles. So we exchange particles. So the Earth is exchanging particles with, with the Sun. You and I, Brady, we are. There's a gra small gravitational attraction between us, and uh, we are exchanging virtual particles. These are called gravitons. Now, you can't just grab a graviton. At, you know, just at some point, the, the gravitons that we're exchanging, you can't just grab it. Right, it, it, they're, they're virtual, they, you, know, you, you can't just isolate one like that. Well, we said, what would happen if, you, if something else helped to mediate the gravitational force? So there wasn't just exchange of these gravitons, there were exchange of other particles too. So we took the simplest scenario, which is that you ex the gravitational force comes from the exchange of these gravitons plus what we call a scalar particle. And this is just a particle that has no directional dependence. Very simple. The Higgs particle that they're looking for at the NH LHC, that's an example of a scalar particle. So, so we asked the question, what's the most general theory describing gravity that involved the exchange of gravitons and this scalar? What's the most general theory you could write down? And we, uh, to our surprise, we, we discovered that some obscure PhD student in the, in the uh, 70s had actually found this. Um, a guy called Hondeski. He'd actually discovered what this theory was. Now, it was very complicated how he wrote it. And uh, when we discovered this, we, we were thinking of a similar thing, but we, we decided to do a search to see if anyone had done, included this scalar field, and we found Hondeski's work. And it was written down in quite a complicated way. It's a big, long expression. Can this theory solve the cosmological constant problem? Are there corners of this theory that solve the cosmological constant problem? And so we asked that question, and we said, right, let's, let's essentially put this theory through our cosmological constant problem filter. Let's demand that this theory can solve it. So essentially, it gives us that extra symmetry that solves the cosmological constant problem. And out popped the Fab Four. It's just remarkable. We had a, such a it's horribly complex theory, really complex theory, and out popped these four very simple sort of building blocks to what, what, what is a solution, essentially, to the cosmological constant problems. It, they, are, they are the building blocks for the symmetry that allows you to, to uh, set that vacuum energy to zero. Uh, there are terms that are, arise in uh, ex explaining the theory. There's four key terms. That's why the four are there. 
there's a lot more to test. For example, we need to test that they can give a viable cosmology, not just that they can you know, degravitate the vacuum energy, but that actually they can give us a viable cosmology you know, over a long period. I like this one. I, I like it, not least because we had great fun doing it, and we're still working very actively on it, but it's, an, it's a nice idea. I think it, I really think it's quite a nice idea. It, it may all collapse. <laughs> I mean, it could be that when we begin to work out quantum corrections to this, the whole thing breaks down on us. Not only that, we need to be able to get reproduce the gravita gravity we see in the solar system. And that's not trivial that you, to do this, but, but actually the fact that you've got these gradients here might, might help in that regard. Let me be upfront about the, the actual solution that, that we, uh, this thing eventually goes to doesn't seem to be quite what we're at today. But what it provides you with is, is an initial way of getting rid of the problem of this big cosmological constant. And that's the, that's the key ingredient.